<coughs> okay, we are good to go. We're going live in five. Well done. Okay, welcome everybody to session 1341, Gangs of New York, How Reclaim the Records, Fought and Won New York City Death Records Access. Our illustrious panel consists of Brooke Gans, Alex Ferretti, Alex Kalzareth, and Michael Moritz. My name is Alana Brock. I am a member of the Jewish Genealogical Societies in Philadelphia and Central New Jersey, and I'm honored to be the session manager for this amazing panel. The session is one hour. They will speak for 45 or 50 minutes and, and have some time for Q&A at the end. Please put your questions in the Q&A section on the right of your screen. I am not monitoring the chat window. The session will be recorded and be viewable in the on-demand presentation area within six hours. Even if it doesn't look on your screen like it's being recorded, I am looking at the button that says now recording and the Q&A portion will be recorded as well. I'm going to give very brief introductions of the panel. Uh, you can look uh, into more info. Brooke Shearer Gans is the founder and president of Reclaim the Records, a nonprofit organization that fights for better public access to historical and genealogical materials held in government agencies, archives, and libraries. One of the largest open records activist groups in America, Reclaim the Records, has filed and won multiple freedom of information lawsuits at the city, state, and federal levels. And there's more about her on the webpage. Alex Ferretti is a New York City-based professional genealogist who works for the Wells Fargo Family and Business History Center, the job that I've tried to get him to give me when he retires, researching family histories for high net worth clients. And Alex Kalsarith joined the board of Reclaim the Records several years ago and enjoys requesting government records to find out the reason behind vital records access policies. And then last but not least, Michael Moritz is an attorney, an avid genealogist with over 15 years of family research experience, having performed research for hundreds of individuals with ancestry in over 35 countries and records written in over 10 languages. So take it away panel. Um, I will mention that we put in the for in current handouts, a link to the Reclaim the Records and um, some other information. Thank you. Hey, hello, everybody. Thank you for joining us today. My name is Brooke Schreier Gans, and this is a panel Gangs of New York How Reclaim the Records Fought and Won New York City's Records Access. So, I'm going to introduce a little bit about our organization, Reclaim the Records. Um, many of you may be familiar with who we are. I usually give an entire talk about who we are, what we do, why we do it, how we do it. This is not that talk. This is a talk about a very specific lawsuit, one of many we filed. So just to give the quick overview as context for this talk, um, my name is Brooke Schreier Gans. Almost everybody in my family is a New York Jew um, for many, many generations, tiny bit in New Jersey, tiny bit in Connecticut, but basically New York Jew. But I moved to California and I focus a lot on New York City records access. And over time, that personal interest, having to get New York City records access from abroad in, in, abroad in California, is what led me to create this organization. Reclaim the Records is, uh, was a pet project of mine that is now a 501c3 nonprofit organization. And we are a group that uses freedom of information laws and open data laws to find records that are hard to get held in government archives or libraries or agencies. We make freedom of information law requests for these records. Um, sometimes we just get them through the request. Sometimes we need to have a lawyer write a letter on our behalf, and that is enough of a push to make things more open. And sometimes we sue them, and we like suing them. It's fun. It's stressful, and it's fun. We get these records. We put them online for free. We are not a paid website. Everything we get, we return to the public because they are all taxpayer funded records that ought to be available. They are often very old records. There was really no need for them to be restricted in the first place. 
So that's a little quick background of who Reclaim the Records is. And I would urge you all to check out our website. It is reclaimtherecords.org. And on our website, you can sign up for our mailing list. We only email very infrequently. We have social media feeds. Become involved. Check out the news on our latest lawsuits. We post copies of all our legal papers, including the papers for this case that we're going to talk about today. And anytime we get records, we put them online. We link to them from our websites. And the records we put online are free to use by anybody for any reason. They can and usually are downloaded by all the commercial and large nonprofit organizations that do genealogy or historical um, records and then republished on their websites. That's totally fine by us. We are happy to share and make these records available to everybody. So today we are talking about a very specific case that Reclaim the Records has been working on for years. And it is a case that is near and dear to a lot of our hearts, especially those of us with New York roots. It is a case to try to get the New York City records bureaucracy to stop being so awful about records access, especially access to old records. And also, for the, one of the first times in our organization's history, we are using freedom of information laws to try to get actual certificates returned to the public not just an index of records, not just a data set, not just old microfilm reels that were already available somewhere. These are actual death certificates from New York City for the years 1949 to 1968. We may actually be able to extend that because this case is taking so long, it could be moving up to the present more. more. Um, we are hoping to get those records and get them online. So this is the first time we've talked about this case publicly. But those of you who maybe know how to use the e-court system or know how to poke around legal filings online may have already seen the spoiler alert. We won half of this case. And the second part of the case, we'll talk about the two halves of it, is currently being decided again at the moment. And it is also going up to the appeal level. Do we have new New York City records to show you today? Not exactly, but we're showing you how we're getting to that point. And it's getting closer and it makes me very excited. So I'm going to turn this over to one of our board members on our organization. This is Alec Ferretti. Alec uh, knows firsthand what it's like to work with New York City bureaucracy and how hard it is to get records out of them, even very old records. So we want to explain very briefly what it is that makes New York so hard to get records out of, how we're using freedom of information laws to force them to give them to us and to you, and then what the elements of the case are, how we discovered more information about their underhanded back uh, back channel schemes. Uh, Alec, Alex Kalzareth is going to talk about how he uses uh, FOIL requests to get emails and calendars, how those have informed our legal choices when we put together the cases. And then Michael Moritz is on our, our call today, too. He is our intrepid attorney. He is also a Jewish genealogist, and he used those two skills together to help craft the perfect arguments for this case using the knowledge of the law, the knowledge of genealogy and what genealogical records ought to be available to put them together to how do you build a case to force a, a government agency, the New York City Department of Health and Mental Hygiene and associated other record holders to turn over records that they don't want to give out. So let's start really quickly with Alec. Um, we're going to do Q&A towards the end. We have a lot to say about this case. We're going to try to cover at least a little of everything. But if you have questions, save them, and we will try to get to you at the end. Over to you. Hi, everybody. So in New York, things are complicated, as it always is. And I want to do a brief overview about what exactly is going on in New York State versus the city versus the archives versus the health department. We want to focus this talk on the health department in New York City but that requires having a slight historical context first. Most states have a unified system of vital record keeping, except for New York. In New York, New York City is in what's called a separate vital records jurisdiction. So New York State has its own laws that govern how New York State records work, and they're centralized to the health department in Albany, and everything besides New York City is included there. New York City has its own set of laws that govern how New York City's records work. They're not centralized with the state. They only live in New York City. And this creates this weird kind of dual leveled system where there's lots of somewhat conflicting laws and regulations that concern how New York City vital records work, because even though it's its own jurisdiction, it is still subject to the laws of New York State. Now, across both the city and the state, there has been decades of lax oversight because legislatures aren't really fans of legislating these days. So 
the agencies often have rather unchecked power. And what happens then is that these agencies end up with their own agendas and they're usually not to help genealogists. So the issues in New York really fall into two different buckets. There's the older stuff and the newer stuff. And the older stuff is not today's talk. Those are the archival records. And that's really for New York City specifically, because in New York State, the older records don't move to the archives. But in New York City, the older Alec, records, I think it'd be it'd be helpful to mention what is, quote, new for these purposes, because they're still pretty I, old. You're going to see the next slide. You're, you're, we're getting there. We're getting there. Um, and apologies, yeah. everyone, if when I'm talking, you hear a noise in the background. I'm uh, I'm traveling and pit stopped in a Starbucks for this. So there's there's noise in the background. Sorry. <laughs> But Michael is correct. The records aren't old at the health. De the records of the health department are relatively old, but we'll get to that in a second. So New York City has a long, long history, and there's really just been constant political chaos. And anybody who took seventh grade social studies would learn about Foss Tweed and Tammany Hall. And really, things haven't changed too much today. And in the 2020s, we have our own political machines who are not necessarily the um, most um, the, the most well-liked or respected politicians, but this is the world we live in. So with that, we are in New York City. And that brings us to the New York City Department of Health and Mental Hygiene, the topic of today's talk. So here we have the actual information. Birth certificates after 1909 are restricted. You have to be a close relative to get access. The same is true for death certificates after 1948. You must be a close relative. And over the last decade, the Department of Health has really made the barriers to access much more difficult. So going forward, birth records are restricted for 125 years and death records for 75. The reason why the years for the 1910 and 49 are the way they are is because of a historical artifact and they're actually going to become even more stringent as the years march on, assuming the current rules remain in place. At the same time, the health department has the propensity to make up their own rules at the, at whenever they feel like it. So it's not as simple as, okay, well, now this record is 75 years old, we can get it, because they often have lots of other things they'll make up. So as an example, here we have two vital records from New York City. They look like any other vital record. We have a birth certificate on the left, a death on the right, there's nothing particularly unique about them. It's a vital record. Um, now, despite New York City trying to remain very tight-lipped with these records, it's possible to find them in other places. So, for example, you can get copies of vital records, death certificates primarily, in probate files. And New York City sometimes tries and like removes them from these probate files, but they're usually still there. And despite New York City Health Department having this whole high horse about how these custodians of these really secretive important records, if you are lucky enough to find one in a probate file, you can get records from the 1990s or the 80s. And surprisingly, no one has ever used these for malice or evil or committed identity theft. And, you know, the health department has all of these claims they like to make up about why access to a 1983 or 1991 death certificate could be used for bad things. But in reality, these are accessible all the time and no one's using them for bad things. Even if you leave New York, they're even more accessible. So in places like California, any death record is a public record. So I can order someone who died death certificate from California if they died yesterday. It's stamped that it's not a valid identity document, but the record itself, the information on it is released to the public. So there is tons of precedent all over the country, including in New York City, for vital records, especially death records, to be made relatively available. So why is the health department sticking to this system where records are not public for 75 years? We don't really know. Um, now, there were other rules that New York City enacted to make things even worse. And these were formally promulgated rules that were published in the city record, and there were hearings, and it happened a long time ago, so we weren't all involved. But in 2008, the department stopped making the indexes available. There used to be indexes on site where you could look at the list of who was born and who died, they got rid of that list. Um, and then in 2016, the New York City Health Department, as um, part of enforcing that 2008 rule, removed index books that had been at the New York Public Library for decades that previously researchers could come and look at. Um, right now, 
the descendants, so a birth certificate is restricted to a descendants if the person is still alive. So if I wanted my grandmother's birth certificate, I couldn't get it until she passes away. Um, there are limits in how many generations removed you could be. So if I wanted my great, great, great grandparents record, that wouldn't be allowed, at least officially. And they've restricted cause of death information even more. So the, it's funny because the medical examiner's office often has more records and they're less stringent about it. But the health department only releases information to very close relatives. And the website itemizes exactly who's entitled, but suffice it to say, it's limited. Now, at the same time, New York City also makes up rules. These are the things where there isn't actually a formal rulemaking process where the city bureaucracy does things and has hearings. This is just rules that they'll call you on the phone and say, yeah, we won't accept this record for this reason. But there's no actual formal rule they're basing it off of. They're just making it up because they have the record, they have the power. So for example, if you want to get a copy of a birth certificate for somebody, the person has to be deceased. And they require a certified copy of that person's death certificate. But that's often problematic because, you know, if, if I'm researching somebody who, for example, and this is a real example, died overseas in World War II, where is his death certificate going to be? Um, there are people who've anglicized their names and the health department won't release them because they say, well, you were born Giuseppe, but now you're going by Joseph, you're a different person. And they'll make that person spend $4,000 on an attorney to get a court order to get their own birth certificate. Um, Amending records requires court orders if you're deceased for the most time. And sometimes even the department misreads their own rules. And once a comma placement error led to a parent being denied their own deceased child's birth certificate. Now, we can't focus on all these issues today or in our litigation. But it's just good to explain how there's many, many things that New York City's health department does that impedes access to records. If you're living, if you're dead, if you're looking for older records, newer records, they are terrible to work with in any possible capacity. Um, at the same time, they're also just a dysfunctional agency. They often lose orders. They reject orders and don't tell you why. Um, they, cl they claim they can't find records that appear in published indexes. So you'll say it's file number 67 of this year, and they'll say we can't find it. Um, even if you're entitled to death information, cause of death information, they just won't send it to you. And I have requests that are outstanding from the year 2020. They're two years old and I've still yet to hear back from them. And they're just a terrible, terrible agency. Um, there are records they have, they probably don't admit to having. So they have pre-adoption records that they claim they don't have, but they do have them. Um, they have an unknown quantity of delayed birth records. And hopefully uh, my sister likes to FaceTime me during every single lecture I give. And that was just her calling for the third time. So if you heard a lot of ringing, that was why. Um, anyway, they have all these unknown delayed birth records that they don't admit to have. Um, and they probably have a lot of supplemental paperwork as well, but we just don't know. So this really all stops with Stephen Schwartz. Stephen Schwartz was the former registrar of the health department. He was the guy who ran the vital records office for a long time. And he was recently demoted upward to the CDC, where he now works in the vital records administration nationwide. But Stephen Schwartz uh, was in charge of an organization called NAPSIS that we'll be discussing shortly. And it's really the lobbying group of all the vital records registrars nationwide that tries to limit access to records because they believe that making vital records accessible is a immense risk to the public welfare. And that's really a basic history on the health department and how terrible they are. Now we're gonna go into a little bit more detail of the rule change and the specific things that we are working on in our lawsuit with Michael. And Brooke's going to take it from here. Thank you. Okay, so as we as we discussed, New York City super dysfunctional, hard to get records out of. Trend over the past decade, decade and a half has been worse and worse and worse. Rules, even though they started out bad and they got worse, they kept digging. In a couple of years ago, about five six years ago, they proposed a new rule change, and this was born out of what was supposed to be a good thing. The good thing was they're supposed to say, you know, we never we the Department of Health that has all these old records old meaning, you know, mid-century, we never had a formal way to transfer blocks of those relatively old records over to the New York City Department of, uh, the New York City Department of Records, meaning municipal archives. We never had a formal way to give them stuff and they had not transferred stuff in many years. So 
ostensibly because they said we need to have a formal way to say after X number of years, we transfer those records to the archives and then anyone can use them at the archives, which have their own problems. Um, they decided, well, we're going to change some rules. And as part of those rules, we're going to change the number of years that New York City vital records, meaning births and deaths, are embargoed unless you're a very close relative. And so they started putting together this rule change and the genealogy community had a huge uproar. Like, what are you doing? You want to change the embargo period for birth records to 125 years. And you want to change the embargo period for death records to 75 years. This is way out of line with the rest of the country. It is out of line with the rest of the state, which comes in handy in our lawsuit because they are still despite being separate departments with their own control over their own vital records, they're still both technically in New York State and they're both controlled by the same New York State Freedom of Information Law, FOIA with an L at the end. Now I should stop for a moment and say one of the things that Reclaim the Records does when it sues these agencies is we are making freedom of information requests. And while FOIA, Freedom of Information Act, FOIA, is by far the most famous of these laws, that law just covers federal agencies. Uh, you'll see it in the news a lot, but it's for things like, you know, Department of Justice, Department of State, USCIS. We are more often using the state level freedom of information laws. And they're not as famous because they tend to have many different names. In New Jersey, it's the Open Public Records Act, OPRA. In New York, it's the Freedom of Information Law, F-O-I-L, FOIL. And so that is the law that we're looking at to try to craft this lawsuit and many other lawsuits we've done in the past. So October 2017 comes around and they have to hold a, a, a meeting, a public meeting on these, these new proposed rules that are going to make it so much harder for an already bad system for you to get records about your own family, many of whom have been dead for over 75 years. It's insane. So a lot of us show up at the public meeting in person. It is genealogists mobilizing in person to protest in, during the public comment period. And I have to give a huge shout out to some of the genealogy organizations who really stepped up to try to raise awareness that this was potentially happening to get people to write in to have petitions. One of them was the NYGNB, the New York Genealogical and Biographical Society, which is a very old school uh, New York based, New York, the entire state based genealogy society. Um, JGS of Long Island, I know, was involved. JGS New York sent out an email letting people know. IAJGS, sponsors of this conference, um, thanks to people who were in, involved with this, wrote a letter, a very good letter that was sent to the board saying, you know, there are a lot of problems with these with these proposed uh, changes to the rules. This is really very a very bad step. Please don't do this. We at Reclaim the Records wrote our own statements and showed up in person. So it was a crowd of genealogists in this little room at the Department of Health in Queens. And let me go forward. This is all of us showing up. Maybe you can see some familiar faces in the crowd. Um, this and I should mention that the court eventually even cited uh, Jan's IAJGS letter. Yes, that letter ended up being very helpful. Thank you, Jan. I see you in the chat. Um, this is Alec there holding up a sign. And the reason he's holding up this sign is that one of the fake reasons the New York City Department of Health and Mental Hygiene was giving for having these incredibly long embargo periods where you couldn't get a copy of the record is they were saying, well, there's a risk of privacy implications. And what if somebody had given birth as a teenage mother, but then the baby died and then you can get the record that the baby died and that implicates that the mother was unwed. I mean, like the most convoluted, ridiculous stuff to try to justify withholding records of dead people. Um, again, there are many, many states. I live in one California where you can get a death record for someone who died yesterday. It's not a problem. The world doesn't end. The sky doesn't fall. But New York City was pushing this line that this was a terrible thing if someone had access and they would use the privacy excuse with no justification and no backup. So this meeting got very heated. There were 62 people in the room. There were thousands of genealogists who had written their own statements or signed petitions. There were no people, zero, zero people in favor of this horrible rule change. And the atmosphere inside the meeting got so tense that they called the cops on us. They had the health department police. Apparently they have their own police force. Three armed guards showed up at the meeting and were stationed outside. This is just one of them. And this is what the kind of guy that Stephen Schwartz is. He would call that on a room full of genealogists. So here's who 
did come out in favor of these wonderful new changes to the health department rules about who can get a death certificate or a birth certificate. There is one organization that Stephen Schwartz was the former president of. The organization is called NAPSIS, N-A-P-H-S-I-S, National Association of Public Health and Information Services, or Statistics and Information Services. They are a nonprofit. They are not part of the government. They are a nonprofit that is entirely composed of the heads of departments of health around the country. So they are a 501c3 nonprofit, but like a cookie cutter, but the actual content of the cookie is all government employees. And they serve to advance their interests. Well, one of their interests is to make records harder to get. And I'll explain why in a second. So of all the thousands of people speaking out against this state rule change, two of them we discovered, and Alec will explain how, two of them we discovered were coming from NAPSIS, except we really discovered they weren't coming from NAPSIS. New York City, who, pr who proposed these rules, sent the letter to their heads at NAPSIS and to their heads at the New York State Department of Health and said, can you sign this letter in support of our rule change? And they did. This is something that I thought was really fun, and we have to thank Alex Calzareth for getting this. One of the ways that they were trying to push forward and did manage to push forward this rule change is the idea of privacy, that there would be horrible privacy implications. Identity theft was their big code word. If you could more easily get a birth certificate, an, even an uncertified birth certificate or an old death certificate. Again, many other states, these are open to the public, at least for more recent years, it's not a big deal. Um, I think you can see the screen. These are really fun documents to have and Alex will explain how he got these. So NAPSIS ended up being the only people who are willing to say, it's so important that we make these things harder to get. Now you might be thinking, why is the city doing this? Like, yes, they were doing this as part of the idea of we're gonna have longer embargo periods because we don't have a formal way of transferring stuff to the archives and we'll just roll this up at the same time. There's another reason. And the reason is money. NAPSIS, again, it's a nonprofit. It is not an arm of the government. NAPSIS wants to make money off records that you don't have access to and I don't have access to, but they, by virtue of their members being heads of departments of health, do have access to. NAPSIS works with LexisNexis to create something called, well, my slides are gone. Is this still recording? Y'all see me? There we go. NAPSIC, NAPSIS works with LexisNexis to create something called the Eve Fact of Death database. There are other databases that they put out there where they sell vital records access to companies. So they're working to write letters or sign off on letters to restrict them in places like New York City. They did this in Washington, D.C. more recently, um, other areas of the country. But then they turn around and as an organization act as a cartel um, and they sell the access so that they themselves make money and the departments of health get a pro rata amount of money based on the sales of people using this database to look up deaths and things like that. So it's really kind of corrupt and gross. And Stephen Schwartz, who promulgated this rule in his role as the New York City head of the registrar, is the former president of NAPSIS. So it all kind of ties together. It's really fun. Here's the Department of Health, the state level Department of Health, signing and adding more material to this letter that the city asked them to write. These were the only two letters in support of this terrible rule change. I'm going to turn this over to Alex now because I think he wants to explain how did we discover yes. these really interesting tidbits, which we then were able to use in the lawsuits. So each state has different freedom of information laws. And as you saw, I'll just go back two slides. So in this slide, the document on the left is actually the Word document that the City Department of Health sent out to NAFSIS and the New York State uh, Registrar. And by filing a separate request saying, I want emails between this government official and this uh, third party, um, the request took a while, but we eventually got thousands of pages back and we were able to piece together the history of uh, how this support that materialized uh, came to pass. And this is something that you can do yourself. NAFSIS is involved in every single jurisdiction that vital records jurisdiction in the United States. You can go find out about who your officials are and what the laws are. We can provide more information if you get in touch with that about how to go about that. And you can 
uh, generally get email correspondence to understand why uh, your officials are doing what they're doing. And just another way that we can find out what are the various uh, archives uh, and departments of health up to is we ask for calendars of key people. So in this case, this is a New York State calendar. It looks like your average Outlook calendar, but we saw that there was a uh, scanning project going on. So from that, that then led us to uh, the scanning contract. And now we have a better understanding of what's digital at the state level. And maybe if something's digital, it's going to be a lower cost for you to get it. There could be other restrictions, but just how do you find out what you should even be asking for since you can't just say, give me everything? A calendar can sometimes be the guide. And here are just another things that have turned up in the calendars. Um, the Municipal Archives, Vitals Finding Aid and Website. This is when they were starting the process to do the website that went online this year. You have fun things like Goats in the Park at Riverside Park. Ken Cobb, the archivist at, <laughs> at uh, the Municipal Archives in New York City, apparently was interested. Just it can be fun. Something we're still investigating, the head of... Uh, Department of Records and Information Services, the archives, has a calendar entry saying, discuss the threat. And there's multiple entries like that. And we have not yet figured out what threat she's talking about. And uh, at the New York state level, when we got the assistant registrar- It's you, Alex, you're the threat. <laughs> we may be the threat. <laughs> so we got the- assistant registrar's calendars at the New York state level. And it's an inventory of records at bomb shelter. And we said, what is that? Uh, we filed more requests and it turns out, it seems like the vital records are actually stored in an old bomb shelter and they were physically doing an inventory of them. Uh, we had asked for inventories. They said they don't exist. They did. But if you have a calendar entry, it's a point to say, look, I know there's something there and give me records related to this item. So just ha that's how you can uh, start getting involved with figuring out what <laughs> what the, your officials and uh, arms are up to. And now I'll turn it back over. Thank you. Okay, so we're at this point where the city has passed these horrible new rules. They ignored 5,000, 6,000 complaints. They only had two people in who were wanted this to go forward. And both those two, we learned through getting emails through a separate freedom of information request. Both those two had been written by them. There was literally no one in favor of this stupid idea, except organizations that could stand to make money from selling access to the records later on. So what do you do? This is the key part. When we think about genealogy and getting records, it's not like we should all be hoping, oh, I wonder if Ancestry got this new record set or Family Search scanned this and they got a good deal and they put it online. Like, that's great. And I subscribe to all the sites too, and I suggest you do too. But at the end of the day, if you want things to happen and it doesn't look like they're gonna happen, you need to file a lawsuit. Despite saying that now, this suit really owes itself to Michael Moritz, who's on this call. Michael contacted me and he actually contacted me twice because I didn't respond to the first email. <laughs> and he said, you know, I've been following the situation in New York and it looks really bad. And I think I see a way that we could at least try filing a suit. Like maybe there could be something. And we at Reclaim the Records had filed and won several suits at this point in time. This was several years ago. But we didn't have an unlimited budget, and I hadn't really thought about what we could even do to stop this, considering they just ignored all of the public comments. But Michael had some good ideas. And better than that, too, Michael was working at the time for Skadden Arps, which is a very large, very well-known law firm that has a pro bono project. Um, and they were allowing him to work on this potentially as a pro bono attorney. He could take the case for Reclaim the Records and use his genealogy skills and his lawyering skills to put them together to craft a case. So we sued. So I want to turn this over to Michael so that he can explain how do you build a case? Like, how do you sue a government agency that, that is clearly that corrupt and terrible to get them to give you the records and fix their rule changes? So Michael, take it away. That's a nice introduction. So thank you, Brooke. Um, and also apologies if there's uh, noises in the background here. I'm in the midst of a trip in California and I'm currently in a Starbucks I just put this background to make it look I'm, like I'm in a law office, but I'm in a Starbucks. Um, anyway, so um, I reached out to Brooke in 2018. And essentially, and by the way, if the noise gets very bad, please let me know. Uh, I reached out to Brooke in 2018 and said, 
Um, I don't like this rule. I don't think it makes sense. And so essentially at the core of what was happening was New York State permits access to death records for anyone after 50 years have passed. And the problem is, oh, I'm being told to speak louder. Maybe if I put my hands here, I don't know. Oh, I have earphones in. Anyway, so um, after 50 years, the records are accessible in New York State. But in New York City, this new law that was being passed by the New York City Board of Health was saying, well, despite the fact that everywhere else in New York State gives records after 50 years, we here in New York City only want to give access to records after 75 years. And if you think about that, that makes no sense. On the basic premise that the reason they said was it's a privacy concern. We need to make it 75 years because identity theft is a big issue. And so we need to restrict access to these records for 75 years after a person has died. Now, if you think about the concept of privacy, how can something be private for 50 years in New York State, let's say in Westchester County, but if the person died in the Bronx, now it has to be private for 75 years? It makes no sense. You know, uh, it's the same uh, record and the privacy concerns are the same whether you live in New York City or any other county in the state. So that's why I reached out to Brooke and said, you know, this really doesn't make sense. There has to be something done about this. And at the time when I reached out to her, I knew they were doing FOIA, you know, general work with freedom of information laws, but I genuinely did not know that much at all about New York State's uh, freedom of information laws. So then what I did was really dived into the freedom of information laws. And what you learn is that New York State's law uh, only applies to New York State, but New York City is carved out. So that's how New York City was able to create its own rules. So the, the one challenge was, well, can New York City create rules that are stricter than New York State? Long story short is they, they actually are allowed to, but they have to have a reason. You, you can't just, you know, arbitrarily create rules. So the approach we took here was, was twofold. One, we filed a freedom of information request for the records, but we also said your rule change, Board of Health, to enact this 75-year ban on death records makes no sense. You couldn't do this. They were allowed to make a, a change, but they couldn't make an irrational change. And so that was really the premise behind this. So we said, one of the bases we said for this was, why would you make a 75 year restriction when everywhere else in New York State is only 50 years? And so the support here is, as you can see in the middle of the slide, it talks about ultra virus actions. And what this means is, so New York City Board of Health is who makes these rules. And they're an administrative agency. It's a group of about 10 people and they're all doctors. And which makes sense for the Board of Health. And so if you think about it, you know, the Board of Health is going to make rules relating to COVID and things like that. It makes sense to have doctors making the rules. But does it make sense to have doctors making the rules on privacy restrictions? That now is far outside of what they have any knowledge of. And so our, our attack here was really saying, you know, we understand you have the right to make the rules. But you have to make rational rules. You have to make rules that make sense. And we told the court that they did not make sense. And there was no basis for them to make rules that made no sense. Why you serve them for 75 years? You've given us no proof. And so we said the rules need to be uh, um, you know, stricken and they need to create new rules. And so we took this two-pronged two approach of saying, one, there's actually no ban under New York law to prevent disclosure of New York City records, even if there is a New York State records, because New York State created this dual system. And then second, even if they deny us access based on those rules, we think the rules should be thrown out. Because as I just described, they have no sense. So that is how this all began. And this all began, oh, there's me and Alec <laughs> at court. 
um, I don't know if someone else wanted to talk about these specific prongs. I believe Brooke or Alec, you were from the court's opinion. Yeah. Okay. So, um, so long story short, then COVID hits. And so this was filed in April of 2019. Uh, then COVID hits and all New York City courts shut down. Uh, the judge was reassigned twice. I think we're on our fourth judge on this case now. And um, finally, in uh, one of you could correct me if I'm wrong, but I believe it's January of this year, uh, the court finally issued the first ruling, which amazingly for us said the New York City Department of Health, uh, the Board of Health, had no basis to enact the rules they did. They were allowed to enact rules, but they had no justification, which they needed, to create the rules they and actually struck down the 75-year ban. Now, everyone says that's great, that's great, uh, but just before you go request new records today, they appealed the decision uh, and there, is a mo there was also a motion uh, for re-argument uh, about another aspect. So don't go today to request a record uh, that's under 75 years old because you will not get it. The case is still pending. But at least stage one and the precedent that was set is the trial court found that the Board of Health had acted ultra-virus beyond the scope of its power in enacting rules that had no legitimate justification and essentially they created their own policy on privacy which made no sense so that's a great great step we've we've had so far and uh uh as i said the, the department of health appealed this decision uh there's another aspect regarding access to the records that uh we just recently let uh in june had uh an oral argument before the judge about getting access first through the FOIL request to all these records and hoping, hoping any day now, uh, she rules in our favor to grant us access to all death records from the 1960s, uh, sorry, from 1949 through 1968. Uh, now, hopefully it would be till 1972, which is making it 50 years beyond what we, uh, the time period at the time. So uh, that's the current status. Uh, it's been really fun to work on, uh, and uh, we have our fingers crossed. I'll let someone else go from here. Thanks. Okay, so I want to just touch on a couple of legal issues and how we put together this case, because we really wanted to like, cover every base to, to explain to the judge, who doesn't know anything about genealogy, presumably, why these records are important. So one of the things we did is we got four affidavits trying to explain all the different particular prongs of why death certificate access is so crucial and why that is should be weighed against any perceived privacy interest in a 75 year old dead person or a person who's been dead 75 years. So we got four affidavits and we were very thankful from people in the genealogy community who agreed to write these up with us and then sign them and get them notarized and they were submitted as part of the lawsuit. And these are a sort of tactic I think we're going to use in many other lawsuits as the reasons why you explain to a judge who doesn't know much about it why you need certain records. So one was we got Roger Jocelyn, who is a well-known New York City genealogist um, who is also um, someone who uh, gives testimony in court. He does a lot of work with New York records. And so his affidavit was to his specialty of why death records are so important in probate cases, air tracing, things like that, and why New York City is so difficult to deal with and so different than not only the rest of the state, but the other states where he has had many decades of work. So thank you, Roger. Second affidavit was from Megan Smolenyak, also a professional genealogist. Megan was until recently on the board of Reclaim the Records. Megan's job is a very interesting job where she is a contractor for the Department of Defense and they repatriate the bodies of fallen servicemen who died in World War II and in the Korean War and Vietnam. Those bodies are still coming home even today, but before they can be laid to rest, they have to do DNA analysis. And then people like Megan are hired to find out not only who they were, go through the old records, but then trace all the lines down to the present. And she has to trace multiple lines because often they can only extract mitochondrial DNA. So she has to find a direct maternal line, things like that. And so she wrote a whole affidavit for us explaining 
A lot of these, these people who died overseas were from New York. There was a very high uh, number of immigrants in the service, in service at that time. It is very important for her job that she is able to bring these people home and give them proper burial and give their families closure. And if New York City is acting like this with regards to records access, it is different than the rest of the country and it impedes her ability to do her job and to fulfill this, this duty for our country. The third person who wrote an affidavit unfortunately died. His name was David Bushman, and maybe maybe some of you know him. He was a Jewish genealogist, a retired attorney, and he wrote in his affidavit about the importance of getting health, of getting the death certificates for health care or for health reasons. David had a family history of BRCA1, I believe, which is, uh, as you know, a terrible genetic mutation that causes um, breast cancer, ovarian cancer, pancreatic cancer. He had killed his mother and I think at least one of his aunts at a young age. He carried the mutation too. And so he made it part of his duty to find through genealogy as many of his cousins as he could to warn them of this genetic time bomb that they were carrying so that they could get tested appropriately and potentially save their lives. Because the New York City Department of Health refused to add the word cousin as an entitled relative to the list of people who could get a death certificate more recently than 75 years, cousins such as David could not find potential other cousins to warn them for a perfectly legitimate health reason. And they were now being blocked by this supposed board of health. David wrote this in his affidavit and then unfortunately he passed away in the very early days of the pandemic. The fourth person who wrote an affidavit for us is Kelly Badami. Kelly does dual citizenship work, particularly for Italy. And she wrote a whole statement for the court explaining New York City is uniquely bad when looking for immigrants who may have Americanized their name or other people who are first generation may have Americanized their name. They often cannot find records that we know they have. This negatively impacts my clients because they cannot reclaim the, their status as naturalized citizens or um, reclaiming nationality from other countries. And therefore, it affects their ability to move, their, their passport, their nationality, all, all sorts of problems. And she wrote that up for us. So this was all submitted along with the case. And if you were thinking, maybe some of you are, about doing legal challenges to other locations in the U.S. that are trying to remove or restrict records access, these are points that you may want to think about, too, to show all the many ways that this has to be weighed and has to be mentioned by the agency in what is a privacy interest, especially when that privacy interest is for someone who's been dead a very long time. Um, so status of the records right now. How are we on time? We have a couple more minutes. So I want to open this up to Q&A too. So status of the lawsuit and the records right now. As you mentioned, there are two parts to this case. There was your rules stink and they were, they were not thought out well at all and they are unnecessarily restrictive. And we want copies of everything through FOIL because we think you have most of it digitized and a little bit of it is still on either microfilm or paper. We filed knowing that we could win one or the other or both or neither. In the original case, we were actually got one of the two that we didn't think we would get. We got the ruling that the city had acted ultra virus, ultra virus. They had overstepped their authorities as a government agency, which is a very rare uh, ruling to get. Usually if you look up ultra virus, it is applied to corporations overstepping their bounds. It is very rare for a city or state agency to be slapped by a judge like that. So that was cool. In the judge's response, she basically said the only reason she wasn't giving over the FOIL part of it, like we're handing you the records, therefore, is because she sort of mistakenly thought that there was no uncertified copy in the possession of the agency. They only ever had certified, so they couldn't hand it to us because FOIL can't be used to make a new record. It can just request a record. Well, uh, important, Brooke. Sorry, one thing to, to mention on that point is this shows the wild concept of why it's so ridiculous that the rules are being made by departments of health is because we challenged this FOIL request and the people who responded from the health department legitimately do not know what it means to be a certified versus a non-certified copy, what they do yes. in other states or anything. So the appeals officer on behalf, the lawyer for the Department of Health wrote to us they cannot give us uncertified records because they don't exist. And we were just like, what do you mean? They're only certified when you certify them. They're not born certified. And so, you know, it, it just to add to what Brooke's saying is it just shows, you know, this is a fight against someone who doesn't know what they're arguing about. 
And so it almost makes it more challenging because the judge adopted their position. And we then had to go back and say to her, wait, John, they actually don't even know what they have themselves and they don't understand this entire concept. So now we need to re-argue this whole issue because of their ignorance of their own records. Right. And that was something that was done over Zoom in June, where I thought that she, because she agreed to even rehear that, this is separate from the appeal. She agreed to rehear that very specific issue where we were saying there was a factual mistake in what you said. I think she got the point in that, in that discussion, like, oh, they have certified rec. They have uncertified records. They become certified when you print them on the special paper and you put the seal on them and they have a date of the date of certification, which is not the same as the date of the record, which is a long time in the past. I think she understood that. We are waiting for her to rule on that specific issue. Nevertheless, this goes forward because they wanted to appeal. They're appealing, so we're counter appealing. Long story short, if you are hoping to get a death certificate, it could be a little while longer. Even if she then rules in our favor on that second issue, I don't know that it would mean she would turn it all over to us while then the appeals still roll through the system and keep going. We might have to wait until we get to like whatever the final level is of this, the final boss level, before anyone ever hands over records to us. And we are a nonprofit organization. If you win a freedom of information law re uh, request, you have to pay for the records. You don't get anything for free and we never have tried to get something for free. If we win these records, if we get to the final boss stage and we win, they may say to us, okay, um, 40 of these years are on hard drives because we already scanned them in our own business and we'll send you hard drives for $140 a drive. But there's a decade of these records, maybe more, that are either on microfilm or on paper. And that makes a big difference because we then would have the right to get those records, but we have to pay for them. Microfilm duplication costs tend to be about $35 a reel from most of the larger vendors. Um, if you assume there's between 1,000 and 2,000 images per microfilm reel, and you can work out how many records there are, it could be tens of thousands of dollars, even if we win everything. Is it worth it? Yes. But I'm bringing it up on this talk to say, if and when we ever get to that point where we can say to the public, we won, we got all the death certificates, they're going to go online forever for free, we just need to pay the invoice. At that point, we are going to reach out to all of you and hope that you, the community, will be able to step up and help us pay for those because that's not a little amount of money. That's at least a five digit sum of money. We can pay for some of that, but we would want to make sure that we could definitely get them after going all these miles to get to this point. So I think we need to start going to Q&A at this point. Alec or Alex, do you have something you want to jump in and say before we go to Q&A? I think we should go to Q&A as soon as we can. Okay, yeah. let's do Thank that. you. I, I put them, I published things in Q&A that I thought you might want to address. Okay. Let's see what we got here. What's the difference between NAPSIS and the Trump charities? No, go to the published ones <laughs> <laughs> or we'll be here all night. <laughs> Uh, is art is reclaim the records doing anything about the uscis immigration and naturalization records they should have released years ago i'm so glad you brought that up yes we have stuff going on it's out of the scope of this q a but yes it is something we have been working on and hypothetically maybe want a lawsuit on that we haven't publicized yet but yes that is absolutely on our radar we mentioned it on social media quite a bit too um, um, there is a USAS panel on Wednesday that I'll be participating in, along with Marion Smith and Renee Carl, which is explicitly not a reclaim the records at USCIS talk. Right. However, I will be discussing some of the logistical hurdles about why it's difficult for reclaim the records or any entity to just simply get the records from them the same way that we could for potentially these records at the health department. So right. come on Wednesday night. It's not as easy for us just to go to USCIS and say, I want all your genealogy records. It's not the same. Um, however, there are ways that we can help them start to follow the law and make sure they are not trying to go around the FOIA process or things like that. There are ways that we can lend public support to make sure that NARA is able to go grab those records back from USCIS. NARA, of course, likes to reclaim records these days, which is a nice change. Um, okay. The other answer also, just to quickly say, is that New York State's FOIL is much more um, favorable to us about releasing information about living individuals. FOIA at the federal level is much more stringent about releasing living individuals information. And of course, these records at USCIS have lots of people who are still alive. So it's the fact that these records need, often will need lots and lots and lots of review before they can be made public. But again, more on Wednesday night. 
Right. And I want to say also that something we have not publicized, but we did just file is another lawsuit at the state level with Michael acting as our attorney. So that's another thing we'll be publicizing very soon. That is for state level records uh, and index. And we will we'll hopefully have more com uh, conversation about that in another day. But there is a lot going on. These cases can take a while to one go their way through the courts, but we are learning every time we build on one of these cases, okay, what are the things we're going to need to bring up? What are their excuses going to be? Oh, they're going to claim privacy. Well, did they proactively claim privacy in their response the first time, or was it the records access officer who brought it up? Did they give any concrete examples? If they didn't give any concrete examples, can we mention that, that they had their one shot and they blew it? Even if they did, did they do a balancing test of the public need for the information? It's not an all or nothing. Furthermore, what rights of privacy does a dead person have anyway? Oh, apparently none. So like all these different things. Oh, for example, they brought up in another case, HIPAA, like magic word will say HIPAA and therefore we can't give you a list of people who died. It's like, no, actually HIPAA, first of all, doesn't apply to vital records offices, at least not in New York, as far as we're aware. And even if it did, then basically there's all these different things we can start talking about. Every time we do one of these cases, we're learning more and more of the blocks and the excuses that they're gonna bring out and we can more effectively, I think, counter them. So someone here mentioned uh, Cook County. That is something that Alex and Alec and I talked to a couple people uh, at the NGS conference in Sacramento about uh, about two months ago, we sat down, we had a whole talk about the Cook County situation. It is absolutely on our radar. We have not filed anything yet, but we are absolutely looking into that, not just for the Cook County vitals, Cook County indexes, but other Illinois area um, records. Some of them may be available only on microfilm, say at IRAD, which is the Illinois um, library system that does have a lot of things microfilmed. There may be ways to get things from them without having to go through departments of health. We're learning the ins and outs of a lot of these systems. So let me go through some more of the questions in Q&A. Um, I see Michael, am I not seeing all the questions in Q&A? Do you guys see one you want to answer or? I, I'm answering answer something. Okay, can NAPSIS work to make the New York state rules, the, I mean the state level? Well, clearly NAPSIS had a hand in agreeing to try to make the New York city rules more uh, more restrictive. Can NAPSIS then do this work at the state level? Yeah, they totally could. They could be putting their fingers in the pies all over the country, and we have evidence of them doing it in several situations. How do we know this? Well, Reclaim the Records won a lawsuit in Missouri um, about two years ago, a year and a half ago, you may have heard of. We won against the, New York, about, against the Missouri Department of Health and Senior Services. We got the Missouri Birth Index and the Missouri Death Index. We won attorney's fees. We won fines. We won all sorts of stuff. In the process of discovery for that lawsuit, we discovered that these same people in this New York City case, Stephen Schwartz and Gretchen Van Wee and all of them and, and NAPSIS, were talking to the people at Missouri trying to get give dirt to them about reclaiming the records to try to help Missouri in their case. Well, obviously it failed because we got six figures out of, the, out of them and uh, uh, their registrar magically happened to retire one day and then the governor happened to the governor. I don't know if it's the governor, one, one of their higher up officials, oh, the head of the Department of Health and Senior Services in Missouri happened to resign the day that our story hit the AP, that was fun, um, where they said they had to give up six figures. So yeah, I think that NAPSIS definitely is a bad actor in this space. And we have lots of emails we've never published that we've gotten from all around the country that show how they are trying to restrict access wherever they can in all these different states and jurisdictions, while at the same time, sell as a product uh, access to companies, to insurance agencies, to government agencies, things like that, that they would not then want to make available to the general public. So we are sort of at completely different points of view. We think public records should be available to the public and they are trying to restrict it so they can then sell it and make a profit, basically what it comes down to. Um, I will note that the largest donor to NAPSIS who enables this kind of bad behavior, one of the largest donors is Ancestry who has a vested interest in keeping records private because then they can sell them. Uh, other questions? So there was a question about uh, DC and reclaim the records. Right, we did not do any action against DC. By the time we heard about it, that had already just gone through the DC um, system, but it was around the same time as the New York City rules changed. This is about five, six years ago, but DC is one of those places that also just enacted stricter embargo time periods on births and deaths for the same sort of ridiculous sounding um, reasoning with the same sort of meddling from NAPSIS. So, so um, I think we're out of time. 
we're out of time, but thank you. That was amazing. And I encourage people to follow up with you, make a donation if they feel it's appropriate. And I'm going to end the webinar and this will be available shortly. Thanks everybody. It was really interesting. Amazing. Thanks. Kicking you all out. It was a countdown. Bye, everyone. Bye. That was great.